us, hopefully. Uh, our keynote speaker is Mario Stahler, and uh, he's my hero because thanks to him, I learned what a Dr. Mood is. You call yourself a Dr. Mood when you have two, more than three PhDs. He has four. Yeah, three. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm very impressed by, uh, by him, and also his whole career is uh, actually also the chairman of the Defense Commission, Commission, right? And uh, I'm really happy to, uh, to have him here. He currently works at the University of Applied Science for Police and Administration at the North Rhine Westphalia in Germany. Now you, the floor is yours for good times. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Um... It's getting any more badass than, than the zombie uh, talk I just witnessed uh, a few hours ago. Um, but I try. I first um, want to lie out that basically the work I'm presenting um, is in collaboration with my friend uh, Sven Kerner, which is over there. Um, so we're, since we're basically doing this stuff together, it's um, absolutely um, important that I mention this in the beginning. So, um, as Daniel uh, uh, pointed out um, already, um, I have a strong affiliation um, to the police as well. Maybe because I was a police officer for 16 years and joined academia sometimes in between, but mainly um, afterwards. So, uh, that's basically um, my connection to martial arts as well. So, um, what we are doing... violent encounters as well and um, yeah they are like in every field um, a few things um, pop up when you're in inside the field and um, that's when I what I would like to talk with you about today um, so um, that you get, um, get a concept um, for the, the context um, where I talk about from um, is basically um, the police and military special forces in Germany um, and here, um, yeah, you can say we have in Germany, I'm not sure how it's in other countries. In Germany, we have um, 16 federal states. Every federal state um, has its own police. And um, inside um, the federal states, they have, in, on the police side, they have these special weapons and tactics teams like SWAT. In Germany, it's called the Einsatzkommando, Spezial Einsatzkommando, SEK. And of course, you have a federal one. Maybe you know this. This is the GSG 9 we have in in, um, in Germany. Um, on the military side, um, you have the um, Kommando Spezialkräfte, KSK. Um, I think it would translate to some special operation forces. So um, the thing I'd like to talk about now, um, because um, we uh, gathered some um, ethnographic data within these, um, yeah, very, I would say, closed domains, maybe. So maybe you get a, an insight a little bit about this um, today. Um, but the overall system we're talking about is police and military special forces, PMSF. So um, if you dig a little bit deeper inside, of that, there's always been a connection between um, yeah, martial arts, self-defense systems and these um, social systems of police and military special um, forces. Mm -hmm. So um, an interesting observation um, we had at one workshop we attended or basically we gave um, at, a, at a military special forces was that um, inside this closed workshop with highly confidential content inside, um, there were a few instructors from civilian yeah, martial arts self-defense systems inside. And why these um, instructors were inside was because they were friends or maybe, uh, maybe they were the trainers, the instructors of the military instructors that were in charge. So they were brought into and they attended the whole workshop um, and discussed the things with us. This was basically quite interesting. And of course, we got a t-shirt from there. Um, this is the one I wore yesterday at the, at the training uh, session, but uh, we were given this t-shirt, um, which basically relates to uh, yeah, a martial arts system or martial art uh, brand inside of Germany. And this was given inside um, yeah, this, this, this highly confidential area. And that's one point. The other point is um, martial arts, um, especially self-defense uh, systems, um, regularly point out that uh, the stuff they're doing, it works because um, it's been used 
within these units. It's created on the battlefield and for the battlefield. That's something um, sixth. Uh, start here. Um, yeah, pointed already out in, in his article. Um, so basically, there's a strong connection. Also, um, if you were looking up on YouTube and um, if you see from a social system theory, uh, YouTube as a kind of structural coupling between these two systems, you see a lot of stuff going on there, advertising courses for like here in Krav Maga, where they're doing military Krav Maga, especially for these forces, but on a civilian ground and with civilians, not necessarily with a military um, personnel and to um, yeah, let you get a glimpse inside, please have a look at the way that hopefully it works. <laughs> within the martial arts community and also within the system of special forces. Um, yeah, and um, it's not that, not just that we see this on YouTube and other social media, we can also uh, trace this back to what's the popular culture. Um, if you maybe know the series um, The Punisher, uh, which basically um, there's uh, the main character, Frank Castle, which was, uh, who was trained in the Marine Corps martial arts program, MSMAP. And uh, that's basically his fighting style. He's um, um, yeah, acting over there. And in, an interesting point is that we see the logo of the Punisher in the Special Forces as well, as tactical patches um, we see in there. And even young police officers we interviewed had them on their vest, on their, west, uh, on their, on their say, tactical, uh, on their body armor uh, uh, patch up to this. So there's a connection um, between um, yeah, these two, two branches. So that's basically um, the setup. Um, from a theoretical point of view, um, yeah, I'd like, or at least um, Sven did it already, uh, introduce you to a very theoretical uh, badass uh, we call uh, Niklas Luhmann. Maybe you know, maybe, maybe you know him. Um, the thing is, um, yeah, his theory of um, social systems, it's uh, at least I perceive it as. Um, really really complicated so it's really really intimidating to get all of this and i didn't think i get it all at that point um, I'm, I'm not sure if i ever will but uh, i would say that this is basically the, the theoretical assumption theoretical lens um, we had a look um, to that what we experienced inside the special forces over there so just to recap what um, sven already um, did uh, two days before, two days before I think. <laughs> Um, it was basically that um, we perceived the two systems, martial arts, the self-defense, um, and uh, police and military special forces as two social systems. And the theory of Nicholas Luhmann basically said that these systems, they are autopoetic. They reproduce themselves all the time via communication. And communication in his theory is basically this kind of threefold selection process between information, form, and connection. So communication has to connect to communication. It has to resonate. Um, and this, that's what basically um, yeah, the systems do. Um, they refer to themselves all the time and keep them going so that they are, so they can distinguish themselves from the environment um, they are in. So basically, these are the theoretical um, yeah, the lens we have to look at um, when we yeah, look at some observational data we gather. So um, I'd like to invite you now to 
dive with me into um, three different um, systems in Germany, which for kind of anonymous uh, or for anonymizing, I just refer to system one, system two, and system three. And um, to give you a short overlook over them. So in system one, we basically um, attended and um, gave a workshop for three days. It was uh, two years ago. System two, um, it was a police system where we um, did a two-day workshop uh, with trainers and uh, special forces trainers. And in system three, we basically um, yeah, spent around six months over there where we did kind of consulting about um, how the training processes could be um, yeah, optimized, I would say. So, um, yeah, and if you ask uh, who looks more bad at, <laughs> you make up your mind, yeah? So, um, okay, let's start into system one. Um, so, uh, four observations, or four observations which are basically um, important um, for the interpretation I have afterwards, um, is basically a military special forces. You remember the task so maybe a military special forces have abroad um, where they um, have to um, yeah, resolve some kind of conflict over there. When we um, were in the um, tactical close quarter combat unit, the unit basically teaches close quarter tactics, tactical Nahkampf in Germany, um, to the other um, officers, to the other soldiers. There was a quite interesting observation. The training room, which is basically was a little bit on the one side, like a dojo, we had um, the mats, the tamis over there. On the left side, there was kind of um, crossfit area, yeah, where you could uh, do all your weight stuff. And we yeah, had, say, in the, in, the, in the quarter of this crossfit area, there was basically an octagon, uh, which was in there. And um, it was introduced to us like this, yeah, and we, even here, we have an octagon, so our soldiers can fight inside the octagon. And they were really proud of this, that they have an octagon. <laughs> <laughs> that was when we were like, okay, okay, nice. So this was basically one observation. What we make out of this, um, yeah, we see later. The second thing was, um, and they really had a, a very high level of say, um, spa area, a spa area that is much, much better than you have in most of the hotels. And, they, and they've introduced it like this. And here we have this the sauna and the cold water and here and there. And here they can prepare for their fights. Okay. Um, yeah, so if the fights are really hard, they can relax here. And, okay. So this was the second observation. The third observation basically was when we talked um, with the trainers, with the instructors who were in this, um, uh, in this unit, which teaches the other ones, and they were basically renowned for their kind of reputation. They were renowned fighters in their respective areas, like Thai boxing, Thai um, MMA, or very renowned um, martial artists in the Krav Maga, for example, or urban combatives. That's basically why they were chosen for this kind of work, to instruct the others. Um, so, and the last thing was, um, you remember, the Tami, CrossFit area, octagon, and on that side, there was a screen a little bit smaller than this one, um, but really, I think it was 95 uh, inch uh, uh, TV screen or something like that. And there, all the time, except for the times when there was training going on, but as soon as the training stopped, the video screen went on and there were martial arts motivational videos running, something like this. My deepest fear is not that we are. My deepest fear is that we are probably unimaginable. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel as if you are around you. It's not just for someone to think of me. Like that, but for 
much, much longer. <laughs> so, so remember, every time you, the lecture stops, such a video goes on. And as soon as you enter the room, you, you have videos like this in a, in a permanent loop going on. It was like, after three days, we went out of this uh, location. <laughs> what, was, what was going on there? So that's basically uh, the fourth observation we think is quite important for our analysis um, we had in the system one. So let's turn um, to system two. System two, um, we basically did a workshop with police trainers um, concerning uh, knife defense. Um, because also this organization, they want to improve their, their, their training for police officers. And the police trainers, they were basically in charge of regular officers. But there were a few people from the special forces within this training group as well. And um, the training we did with them was basically something like we did yesterday, the ones of you who um, experienced the, the introduction session we had in the evening. It was easily playful, but very complex, where you have to be very situational aware, deal with different problems at different times. And of course, um, throughout the workshop, you can um, take this up notch by notch. Um, so um, here in the middle, I'll show you a short training video we did with another um, special unit just to get an idea of what this kind of training looks like. What you will see there that there are different units training simultaneously in a very chaotic situation. And they get used to situations, situations, situations in a very short amount of time in a very, let's say, playful manner. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you get an idea. So uh, the thing is, um, so that they get used to um, very, yeah, a few situations, many, many of them in a short amount of time, they are really could train their skills in a very playful manner. They have to care about each other. So it's very, very easy going. But nevertheless, and here we introduce some concepts. It like, it's what's like we did uh, yesterday in the evening. So um, we did training um, kind of this um, within the police trainers where the special um, unit guys were in there as well. And what happened basically was that these guys, they quit. They just went during the training, like yesterday evening, they went to the side. They were standing like this. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> they were looking and they were just joking about the playful stuff the others were doing, the other police trainers. And the other police trainers, they were really invested into this because they had, they had fun, they could um, train, practice their skills within. And these um, the special unit trainers, they basically refrained from training. And they couldn't. They were just standing there and observing. And, and when we asked them later on about, okay, um, uh, what was the problem over there? Can you show us how you do it with the knife or something like that? We cannot talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. And how they it. They didn't say we have to kill you otherwise, but that was basically the, the sentence that was missing. And this was basically interesting because we are uh, working with all, uh, with a lot of special units in Germany uh, like this, so that basically for us there are no secrets, but it was really interesting. It was the established kind of hierarchy, though you don't know this thing, and I don't talk to you about that. Um, and they they didn't like the playful manner, I think we had with them, because, um, yeah, let's see why. <laughs> Later on. Okay, so this was basically system two. 
And the last, uh, uh, the last observation I'd like to talk about uh, was basically in System Three. In System Three, where we did this kind of consulting for the uh, for, for the unit, um, there were um, close uh, quarter combat uh, trainers, which were basically in charge of training the unit. And when we asked them, we did interviews um, with them. We asked them, um, yeah, how do you select the content? meaning for the training you have with the, with the, with the uh, police officers in there. And they said, yeah, I basically decide by myself. I look up the internet. I uh, have some kind of uh, tips I get from other people. And then I join some training over here. I go on a workshop over there. I make an instructor, uh, I do an instructor's course over there. And I just take the stuff. So it was really a kind of individual selection criteria why certain content comes into the system of this very highly trained professional police. There were no organizational procedures um, there that um, prevented some stuff from coming in or it was just, if the trainer says, this is good, it's good. It's good because it's good. <laughs> kind, of, kind of interesting. And um, in other studies, um, when we had a look at this point, it's like, yeah, one can think, um, why does this stuff comes into the system? Is it like because it's hot shit? Is it because of the old biography? Because he's a, let's say, a better trainer, that's why he, he has been drawn to a competitors, did he do Krav Maga? That's why he's been Krav Maga inside, or what's, what's the thing there? So that's basically the, the third observation in the third system. Okay, so um, with this kind of empirical data um, that we have, um, let's have a look at the layers of functionality. So basically, um, the thing is, um, from a social systems perspective, it is like um, what we have to think about is what problem does a particular aspect solve? Because if this aspect is prevalent inside the system, it's therefore purpose. It solves a problem. So the, thing is, uh, the thing is, which problem does it solve? Um, for which aspect is this the solution? And this is uh, what I want to talk with you or maybe discuss later on um, about. So quite obvious um, is um, yeah, one function. Why do martial arts um, or why are martial arts prevalent inside the system? Inside the system of policing and military special forces. It's like quite easily, it's because they have to manage conflict. Um, that's the solution, obviously. The problem on the other side seems to be uh, that of course um, it has to be evaluated at some point. Is the solution? Does this really work? Does it really improve the competence to manage these conflicts? And when we ask this question inside the system, we um, yeah, gained insights into what we call a structural knowledge deficit. So basically, the unit does know all the units. It's like, do you ever think it works? <laughs> but if or if not, there is no systematic data um, gathered nor analyzed um, that you can prove or disprove why a certain system comes inside or why certain aspects are taught. So it's a solution on the one hand, create, creates uh, problems on, the, on another end. Of course, a second function um, is um, if training is provided, yeah, it's a good point because um, the box has to be checked. Um, we have procedures in Germany where it's stated that if you are mandated, mandated to some tasks, you have to be prepared for it. So there has to be some training. Okay, managing the violent conflict, so we have to have some training. Martial arts training seems like a good fit, so done. Box ticked. Um, as soon as martial arts training takes place. Interestingly, um, when we asked, yeah, how is the reception of the martial arts training within the uh, community of special forces, it's like, yeah, there are not so many people showing up to the training, but uh, from an organizational point of view, you can say training is provided, box is ticked. And the other thing is, um, even though guys show up for training, and I have to say guys at this point, because I think in all the systems we were, there were only, yeah, male officers and male soldiers um, in there. And the thing is, um, participation doesn't equal learning at this point. So, so the checking the boxing is a solution of the one part of the end, and on the other, it's a problem. Yeah, um, another function could be, um, 
as a yeah, you could say kind of um, a relevance criteria, um, the hot shit. Um, it's been chosen, the martial arts system has been chosen because it is the hot shit. It's the thing you have to do. Um, and this is uh, kind of interesting because um, the more it's like hot shit, the better it is accepted within the system because it's the top notch stuff. The thing with hot shit is hot shit is only hot if it's compared to some other, whatever the other is, but it's, it has to be a more traditional thing. So it has to reinvent itself all the time to be hot shit. Otherwise, it's not, you know, hot shit. <laughs> Um, so um, at this point, um, uh, we could say, or that's basically what we observe, that this kind of drawing towards the hot ship um, distracts from what is actually the function of this kind of training here, meaning preparing for the mind the task, tasks of uh, managing violent conflict. Um, so yeah, solution, acceptance on the one hand, because everybody buys into this, is if there's a hot ship training provided, everybody does it, nobody asks questions. But on the other hand, does this really prepare for the thing? So, you know, octagon, I'm not sure how you're familiar with military operations, but at least we don't know that any have taken place inside an octagon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just, but the thing is, this question wasn't raised by anybody. And this is really interesting at this point. Uh, of, our, of our analysis. So um, when we talk about hot shit, there's also the question, yeah, but when it's labeled hot shit, of course, when it's uh, different, but there comes another aspect um, into it. And this is what we basically um, gave the title towards this keynote. It's what we call, yeah, it's like badassness. Um, if you look up badassness, it's always about if yeah, something is tough, something is intimidating, it's impressive, uncompromising, yeah, um, slightly frightening, and maybe because of that, a little bit of a miracle. So um, the thing is, um, badassness seems to be a little bit like a filter by this information comes inside the organization, inside a white choosing, the kind of relevance criteria. Um, and the problem with it is that it basically becomes a value of its own. In German, you can say Eigenwert. Um, it becomes an Eigenwert. And this basically, this badassness we see, if you remember the YouTube video from the beginning, from the Krupp Maga military course, it's like these, we see this in the, in the domain of um, martial arts. And we see this um, relevance criteria inside um, the forces. So it connects them at some point of view. If you're badass, that's why you're, you're there, or that's why your content is there. And that's basically um, the thing we have to reflect um, why we are inside the system. Because interestingly, nobody um, has asked us before because of the knowledge we had. The thing we had to do was first we had to punch them, and then they were listening. <laughs> so we had to prove our badassness to them before they were open to the content. We had to provide from a scientific point of view. And this is really um, quite interesting. So, um, yeah, we would say badassness plays a crucial role within these systems. So, um, on the one hand, it's a kind of self description. They describe themselves as in the, in the martial arts domain related to this, and like Propaganda, Urban Combatives, and all this stuff, Marine Corps training program, and in the stuff of, you know, badass. And on the same end, they act out this badassness via clothes, via um, the attitude they have, um, the hierarchies that take place, basically around everything um, um, yeah, has to do something with that. And if we dig, dig, uh, dig a little bit deeper inside of that, there comes another um, um, yeah, functional aspect. It's basically creating a kind of, a kind of bear from this uh, culture of dominance. Um, which we encounter in there. So, um, yeah, if you look at um, dominance and, uh, and prestige, you would say that dominance basically inflicts cost in a society where, benef where prestige is related to um, benefiting others. And maybe because of dominance or prestige, you gain kind of uh, social status. Interestingly, within the special forces, these two are related. Uh, to each other. So you create your status within the group um, via prestige. The prestige is gained by dominant behavior. And on the other hand, if you have the uh, uh, prestige inside the community over there, 
maybe you incorporated this kind of dominance as the basic social scheme to uh, social scheme to social interactions and that's maybe we have a kind of problem i'm not sure in if it's in the other countries but at least in germany we have a few problems with um yeah radicalized subgroups within special units in the last two years over there. I'm not sure how it, how it is in the other countries, but uh, maybe this could um, yeah, connect uh, to each other. That's basically something you have to think about. So um, on the one hand, of course, this kind of badassness is a kind of solution, this kind of dominance uh, hierarchy, um, because if you're into violent conflict and if, it, if it's getting really violent, you have to dominate the other party. But the cost on the other side, or at the, at the same time, it's creating a problem if, you're, if your whole culture is built around this. So, um, yeah, what are basically the core con conclusions we um, have uh, from this analysis? So, um, we would propose the argument that basically um, between uh, these martial arts systems that relate to um, some kind of military, police, special forces, um, the badassness, the badassness serves a kind of self-stabilization within these systems and connects them together like a structural couple, uh, coupling. But on the other hand, um, we can perceive things we encounter within these systems as solutions and also as problems, which are here, yeah, solutions, and problems and solutions and problems. And um, this is just the social theory aspect of it. It's just not normatively framed from a normative perspective, of course. And we have to say, we have to point out as researchers this kind of thing. And you only can control such environments um, if you have the insights into these processes. Because um, they wouldn't be gained very much if you just say, okay, dominance doesn't have to play a role within these systems because it's a crucial aspect of the work they're doing. It's just how to navigate within this very special field, which is basically very, very close, which is a problem on its own, of course, because there is no much reflecting knowledge coming in. And that's why it's, yeah, at some point we, we have to play by the rules, meaning acting out the bad business ourselves to be inside the system to make change, you know? That's, yeah, I think. So basically, these are um, 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 some core observations or the core conclusions we draw. And a uh, thing we are thinking about right now is like, yeah, maybe is uh, irony is kind of observable behavior when we see that somebody has this insight in kind of these processes. Because um, if we um, if we make some jokes about big biceps and something like this about their bad essence behavior, it's like. <laughs> it's not perceived as very funny, you know. <laughs> it's like we which were laughing and have never won. <laughs> so if you say something like, yeah, you go first, you have the uh, you are the most massive one, it's like what is this joking about? <laughs> it's like they didn't get the concept. So some of them, some some, some do. So that's a point we have to think about in the future. Just uh, just say. So and, and another aspect. <coughs> This will maybe be, uh, be a spin-off of the series. Mm. That's a point that comes to our mind, I think, one week ago, where we um, yeah, observed another unique system. And it was basically um, the thing about radicalizations when talked already about it, and the narrowing, narrowing down of conflict resolution, um, meaning that this kind of badassness um, have some problems um, on the other side. Um, there has been a paper which has been come out, which I really recommend at this point from Kruller. It's from last week, basically, you know, from superiority to supremacy. Um, and he's basically exploring radicalization processes within Canadian, US, and German uh, special units. And he's proposing the argument that um, this unique culture, which he basically could only refer to via media news, and creates some problems on its own, um, which you see basically on the on the right side. We have this elite warrior subculture. Um, we have these problems with social hierarchy that is basically um, yeah enacted out through dominance, um, and you have this kind of cognitive rigidity that it's not a neither nor, but it's not an it depends approach. It's like black or white, good and bad. Uh, 
uh, there, these are uh, cognitive structures you encounter over there. And another aspect is um, if we are looking at that thing we are thinking about, it's like the speed of conflict, the conflict resolution. Um, if you have this mindset of um, I'm very badass, I'm very aggressive, forward aggressiveness, and you have this kind of forward aggressiveness in every encounter, there's somebody with a knife, maybe there's a mental problem behind this mental health issue. Um, it's not the best option to immediately charge. It's just like, stay back, observe, try to talk. If there's no immediate danger, if you have this kind of you have to go forward every time you create um, a dynamic which is getting fast every time so you're doing something the other person is doing something and it immediately gets out of hand so a good point for de-escalation is always slowing down and this doesn't relate to bad essence forward aggression so at this point i really like to give a big shout out to some colleagues we uh, we met from San Francisco, which just said, when we hear there is a knife call, say, hey, that's good. We get out of the car and just watch. <laughs> watch, observe. And then, yeah, you slowly approach and ask what's going on. I was like, yeah, this is a very good concept. They even get away from the problem. They disengage. So they slow things down. And this is, yeah, I think we were thinking about but it doesn't relate to bad assness because a bad assness and getting away from a problem doesn't relate to, to another. So yeah, things we would like to think about in the future um, and we have not thought it through yet, but I just want to point it out. Lots of things to do, maybe somebody likes to join, whatever, some idea. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario. And I open the floor uh, for questions. Thank you, Mario. Really awesome presentation, uh, as always. Um, I, I kind of hate myself for asking this question because I'm often the first to um, sort of shoot down the suggestion that whenever men do martial arts, uh, it's always going to be about masculinity, isn't it? But it did feel like maybe um, kind of a present or uh, absent presence here, like maybe. To what extent, I guess, is masculinity possibly a useful analytical frame here, particularly when we start thinking about, um, and I'm thinking perhaps in the British context, but quite regular scandals in our military around bullying, sexual harassment, abuse of female soldiers. And you mentioned this, there was no women in some groups that ever made the military playing that didn't see any female bodies there. So, it, how does gender kind of feature in this arrangement? Give us all. Um, Toxic masculinity environment, definitely. Um, that, that's what we encountered over there. That's that's uh, we have a few data points and there's a few so many observations which basically feed into this. Yeah, it's definitely a big issue. Even if you're asking why or like the criteria to come into this unit, one that is first rate, it's not about you have to do certain things, it's like men. Yeah, that's that's a thing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there's a, a lot to work on on worldviews, I would say, in several uh, on several aspects, not just uh, on the gender issues, but also on ethnicity and, and all the stuff. And I'm just just briefly sort of following up on, on that. Does the fact that this is perhaps connected to masculinity make um, maybe it's a little more resistance to uh, suggestions of change that maybe softer, uh, more painful approaches are, are uh, more likely to look down and frown upon the special forces guys who. Yeah, that, that, that's what we encounter that, that as soon as it's getting playful or something um, like that, it's, it's hard to reach them for the, I would say, main audience. Um, we are working now with one um, uh, special unit, which I think by chance they are open, but there are some supervisors at different hierarchy levels um, and this came together so they are open to change now and here we have the first time uh, the impression that even uh, the masculinity thing is changing a little bit or they are more open to other conceptions of humanity I would think it's not just that it's a gender or something like that but in others horror mm -hmm. yeah. yeah thank you for such a great presentation I have a question when you said that uh, if a uh, conflict arises, cool down and remain in co 
along as a means of uh, hindering its escalation. Uh, however, I have a question regarding this, that do you already have a qualitative means to define how to cool down? Because I also started thinking that if you are too calm, maybe the attacker can think for a pushover and still go and attack. Or do you have a means of defining this? Yeah. The question you were asking is more like, does this technique work? Or yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So um, techniques only work in specific situations because they solve problems in specific situations. So it's always like it's a tool, but there's no guarantee that this tool is the right tool in every situation. So um, the thing is, it is one tool, and in certain instances, it can be the tool. But in others, it's basically um, the wrong tool. And, uh, and that's basically what the um, good conflict management training is about. That um, you as a learner learn particularities of these different situations and have a good feeling which tool to apply in which situation. That's why there is a problem when tools are excluded from the training process at all. And that's what we basically yeah, sometimes encounter in, in police training in general, but certain aspects of hey, you can uh, resolve conflict by de-escalation, it doesn't play a role sometimes. Um, yeah, that's more thing. It, it does, disengagement works in certain instances, in others it don't. And you have to figure out through training, analysis of, um, of case studies when it's the case. So, um, in, in my imagination, the people who watch that kind of badassness videos on YouTube content, the kind of target audience for, for that kind of content are people who are not really involved in violence or sport, in my fantasy, as I said. Um, but rather, this is kind of the fantasy world of like the target audience of the Marvel universe and, and basically couch, couch potatoes. But uh, that's my, my world of fantasy and prejudice, and that's my question. Uh, more specifically, how do the people who are teachers inside the systems of high-level violence specialists uh, take their, what do they base their decisions on how they train their guys and who takes the decisions on what they buy from external sources? Does that make sense to the question? The second question um, is basically this kind of individual selection that they decide by themselves. And so who's the, the trainers. The instructors. The trainers. The trainers. The trainers. The trainers. The trainers. They say, okay, I think the system XYZ seems like good because I saw this YouTube video or I get this recommendation. So please, uh, they, they're gonna, um, yeah, that they get the, when you say these slides, uh, that they get, that they get the expenses paid for this instructor course where they're doing this in the civilian domain and come back. And also, it's like um, this um, the system of, of, of special forces, I mean, the trainers with that system, it's a closed system even on an international level. So that's why we, we just went to the US and witnessed the um, police training conference over there. And, what, and we were really, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was hard for us to take because in Germany, they refer to these systems and take the content to Germany. And uh, that's why um, the yeah, the knowledge resonates within the system. So it's more like um, what is, it's famous because it's famous. It's, 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 it's the thing. And there are, there are no organizational procedures um, which content comes in or which doesn't. It's more like, yeah, this is famous. Yeah, you see this. And famous it gets because you see it always in the public domain, like Google or whatever. It's always referred to within the system as this is badass. And then you do it. And then in the end, you by octagons <laughs> and, uh, in the recording, of course, MMA has a bad reputation. There's a real fight going on. That's why they're training MMA at some point. And they don't reflect if this has anything to, you have to look at how these soldiers are dressed in their combative environment. I'm wondering how MMA is done with that. 
you know? That's, that, that's mm -hmm. really, this was the second question. And the first one, I forgot it, sorry. Like, what do they base their decisions on? But yeah, basically, the answer that YouTube is their database. <laughs> and like, I was thinking in my fantasy, they had like huge databases of recordings of military operations and analysis of, uh, and, then, and then best practices and whatever. But that seems to. That's what we can assume. Um, uh, in these instances, we well, where we um, conducted interviews with trainers, um, and this we did in, the, in these consulting processes. Um, yeah, there there's a lot of anecdotal data they refer to. I've heard from this situation, and this should have been work. It's basically like we have in the civilian domain. What right? does this self defense? So yeah, I know a guy who basically did this or that, and that's why this is the. It's the wrong time. Yeah, it's basically it's basically the same. And when we ask you, where's the data? Can you just because every every operation is basically filmed from different angles. They have the, 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 the cameras on the helmets and all the stuff. So basically it would be no problem to get a data analyst, just watch all the videos, point out special parameters of these situations. It's not been done. And this is quite interesting concerning all the money that is spent into Octagon. Any <laughs> follow-up question? Is anyone else Yes, just wondering, you mentioned a couple of times, I think there wasn't sort of an overarching regulatory framework here. And I think that came up pretty really nicely in the answer to that question as well. Um, I mean, I'm presuming that the, the guys who are, who are wielding automatic weapons, they, they saw how to use and operate those according to a, a formalizing and perhaps, dare I say, like controlled syllabus. One would hope that we sort of more formalization rather than just YouTube or I don't know. I mean, yeah, John Wick, but there's there was that movie that I thought it was called where they were doing a gun counter or something. Ah, the big gun counter is like so, yeah. so, yeah. equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Christian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but someone who was like 15 at the time. That's great. And so I guess my question is um, who is or should be regulating combatives? If presumably, hopefully, somebody is regulating firearms. <laughs> and what, what routes could you guys have, perhaps, for using your very critical and I think really important research to say, look, something's going wrong here? Um, That's basically the thing we are doing. Um, we are we are lucky that we have one food inside the system, and it's stuck deeply inside. I would say it's like um, that. That's a good thing, um, and that's why we, of course, observe. And try to advocate for a kind of yeah evidence-based approach to it, um, and to, to to point out the value of scientific inquiry in in helping to optimize learning environments. But also, we started by focusing on learning environments, how to best teach things, and we came. The more you dig deeper, you come to other issues like cultural issues, like. The warrior mindset and all stuff—it's all connected to each other. Masculinity issues of masculinity, and then the pop culture comes into because you see that they are training the things. Because in John Wick, it was like this. And even if you talk about equilibrium, one of the actors there was a special unit guy, which came from one German special. It's like you know, it's interconnected, and the, the knowledge resonates in there, but. Um, there is not, because of the closeness of the police and even military domain, and even if you're then looking at use of force, it's even more close because the police is under scrutiny. It's like they want to download inside my data or whatever. It's, it's really hard to, to get a close look. That's why it's good that we're already inside, so they can get us out. And, and we, of course, help on an operational level, like, hey, maybe you can teach like this or like that, but we slowly try to shift even cultural values inside because we encounter every time. But like we are, of course, if you, if you point out all the problems we see at once, I'm not sure if this helps anybody. This wouldn't resonate inside the system because the logic we are operating with is a different logic than these systems operate within this. And that's why I think the social system theory is a very good theory. To, to, to get your head around it, because for them, it's the solution in various aspects. It's only in force, it's the problem of all civilian domain, and that's why you have to, 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 yeah, to get more insights into this from different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah.
I've seen close here. So, the question being reductive, it sounds to me like badassness isn't simply. Pregnancy is singular, right? as in, like, if we think of uh, if we think of that essence as, as a motive, uh, that maybe all of these systems no longer even consider the problems. They're simply seeking more badassness, like more more hard rock guitars behind their slow mo videos of people getting much Like they don't even care about the actual problems or what could be solutions. But it's, uh, as with any other affect, it's become its own motive, right? I simply seek more badassness. Um, if if that's case, uh, are, are they simply sort of just running an infinite growth of badassness? Like, as you were saying, uh, at the end, there was speed, right? We just have to get more and more badass. Yeah, that's basically the, the thing when you call it an uh, eigenwert. I'm not sure how the, 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 the translation would be. It's like, when you're on its own, it's like, yeah, yeah that's a singularity. But we see at some point that other aspects also play a role, like if the box ticks, then of course we have to think about the, the, the mandate it has. Sometimes it comes into mind with the individual person, but the culture itself, uh, it regulates itself. That's why it's really interesting and we want to build a case study around this, why this specific unit we're working right now, why they are open to change. It, it seems like that there are some specific organizational um, Incidents where they all the managers which are in line are basically on the same page and they want to try to change the culture. And we, then uh, the, the, the officers inside the unit they are also open to change because luckily one of them is uh, married to a, to, a, to a teacher and, and they get other aspects because a lot of times you the police officer is married to a police officer, you know, and then the culture is very close and then you get the same perspective on the same issues and you only see the solutions and not the problem your solutions create on the other side so yeah similarity thank you mario um if, if i understood one part of your argument correctly then if you give a hammer everything looks like a big and this is basically what happens in, in the police forces um so if, if they're really striving for badassness to be effective in onwards do you have um, like well, evidence for this feedback loop feeding back into the police? Because um, if, if you, this is, in my, in my words, this would be, um, well, fighting as a discursive entity is enacted in these circles by didactic practices, by training practices, by evoking such masculine identities. And at the same time, this is what shapes the, the bodies of the officers who, are, who then go into actual combat, maybe or maybe not. So is there a feedback feeling back from the actual violence scenarios um, or saying that they were right to do this like that? Or is, is there, is there this, this sort of evidence-based look at real-life scenarios? I wouldn't say that we, at this point where we are right now, um, basically understand everything which is going on um, there. Um, an aspect that I want to add, but it's more a, a question you're asking us, and not maybe a direct answer to your question. It's like that even there you have to um, you have to distinguish between the special forces, which basically bad essence and dominance is a kind of solution in a lot of situations over there but the thing is it's contagious to all other aspects that are going on there but the thing is that the normal police officers they are basically looking towards the special um, forces as this is basically our hierarchy so i'm on this level and these are the special forces but it should be other it's like our job is different and we are at, on the same we're just having another another task, you know, where our task is community policing or criminal policing or whatever, and it's just another task, and we are experts on this. But the thing is, within the police, it's more like they look towards, and even the trainers, the police trainers, they don't, or they, lots of them we asked and interviewed, um, they, where they get their knowledge from, they really like to do some kind of um, practicum, how they call it, some kind of uh, internship within the special forces, even though they are instructing regular police officers. It's like, this doesn't fit the task. So there, there you have a kind of feedback loop, and then at the end you have officers on the street, which basically later on maybe want to join the special forces, and they are already with this mindset. So I think 
we have to look at the various different tasks the police have to do, and we have to tailor specific programs and concerning conflict management, tailor conflict, um, specific programs to the specific, specific tasks these individual units have. And a long way to go because we're not small one size fits all of them. Yeah, I think it's time for a bill question. Um, it's, it's, it's very confronting to think and very useful to think about police and special forces. If you come from experience in Hong Kong over the last few years where a much loved police force has suddenly become an open partner of the triads under the control of the government, but also from Australia, where the corruption is so um, every day, uh, it's confronting for me to not first think about police and special forces as the bad people to whom you want to do bad things. So I found that really hard to listen to at the beginning and then increasingly illuminating and fascinating. But my question, I think, is very simple and it's probably the same thing people have been asking. But what do um, any non-sociopathic subjects in these units, but particularly, I think, the special forces, what do they think in their uh, idealistic moments is the point of their badassness? I understand about survival, refusing particular situations, and particularly when you talk about radicalization and the kinds of genuine conflicts that, can, that will erupt. But from the moment where somebody comes in as a recruit and then is trained through all these things, does the idea of the point of it for the larger social world even pose itself anymore? after the training. I'm sure there's not one answer to that, there must be a spectrum, but, but what do they think they're doing? That's a good question. But the thing is, um, from a scientific point of view, that's the point I think why it's uh, real valuable that we start researching this kind of area, because you know, of course, of course the linkage to martial arts as well, but there is empirical data regarding such kind of questions that is basically non available. It's like, um, even the, the paper I recommended to you, it's like based on data which are in open reports uh, in governmental agencies. But there's only the things that are reported and they are yeah, worked on. But um, having a hands on data gathering, it's really hard to get it. We're starting to get this more and more. Um, so that's, of course, questions we. We'd like to pose, we'd like to ask. Um, I hope more is coming up, but I can't give you an answer. I just can assume things right now. Thank you. I, I have a question. I'm thinking um, about my own data. So I studied jujitsu, um, and in my field, say in Rio, a lot of people in the gym. Our police officers, our military, are the trainers who train the Navy BJJ. Um, and I'm wondering, thinking about the connections between the two, if there's room for redefining what a badass is. Um, because in, uh, one of the things that struck me was this playing of the video constantly in the background. And it reminds me of like random Collins and emotional entrainment and getting caught up in that moment in the violent spiraling. And contributing to that forward motion. Um, and then the gym in Rio is, is very interesting to me because, like, no music. You cannot have music in the gym because that will cause you to get caught up in the moment and go into that forward spiral and it will go up and down. And they saw that as weakness. They saw that as we need to be in control of our emotions. We need to be stoic. We are not affected by our environment and we need to stay in control and that's us being controlled by music instead of being in our own situation. So is there room to redefine like what a badass is and how might how might or how would you see um, potential for doing that in the new circles? I definitely see this kind of potential because 
because I don't see that because the system seems to be drawn from this from this aspect of badassness that you can't get around it. You know, so that's basically I think a possible solution would be trying to redefine it slowly. So that's basically um, from a normative point of view, this would be I think a really good approach because yeah, I don't think that the system will get rid of it. Yeah. But it's about how you define it or how you start, uh, slowly shape the culture towards it. Yeah, it's because one of the things that I saw was that um, they made comparisons between like their gym where they're police and military and other people as well, um, and then gyms that are sort of seen as lower class or favelas or like potentially people who are engaged in day to day violence and they play music. Or they're MMA fighters, or they're in, you know, training for the UFC, and that's seen as like one of these tough guys, whereas they're involved in real violence and they don't let themselves get affected by that. So I don't know if there's a, if that's something to think about. That's really interesting. Yeah. Because in every every yeah, social system, especially tries to reframe or frame the own behavior, the own thing as that's why we are the badass. Uh, <laughs> that's it. That's the last question I think, Christian. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to comment something about the maybe a uh, solution which can be investigated if uh, it's going to bring up the harassment uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's about how they uh, manage to, to find a solution for training in uh, police and uh, I'm not sure about special forces in Japan. Because they said uh, at some point in the 60s, I think, uh, martial arts come from the battlefield, so they need uh, the, the, the end of uh, the solution is to, to possibly kill the guy because you're in the battlefield and you have it from the I don't know, samurai origin and things like this. And this were not fit, was not fit for, for the modern time and for police training. And that's why they didn't adapt, uh, they didn't uh, adopt a full system of martial arts, but they, uh, they made uh, a board. And uh, police officials, uh, uh, they made a very clear requirement for a new system, which uh, uh, eventually was called Aikojutsu. And uh, they bring up together little pieces from various arts, like uh, a little bit of striking, not too much in order to have a non-violent solution, a lot of restraining techniques, uh, some uh, special techniques of using the weapon that a policeman can use, uh, probably techniques of using, uh, I don't know, teamwork, uh, which is not commonly fine in uh, sports martial arts and even in some traditional martial arts. So can this be a, a valid approach? The thing is, I think in Germany, um, we've already been in there, meaning um, that what what is trained within the police, in the regular police, and also um, in, the, in, the, in the police forces, it's like they're in police training. It's called police training. But the thing is, if you're looking at the content and what is in there, then you see what we basically observe that that what is called police training. They don't say, this is Krav Maga we are doing. But the thing is, they got the Krav Maga instructor inside. The Krav Maga instructor teaches the Krav Maga things. They just say, it's like, okay, that's our military close combat training or whatever. It's like, um, the form procedures you have, it's like, okay, the formal system has to be, they have to uh, be able to de-escalate, confront or whatever and all this stuff. But the thing is, when you are actually seeing what is being done, then different things emerge. And this is for us quite interesting. Yes. So, yes. so, so I'm not sure if this is, um, can be addressed on a, on a, on a regulatory um, Aspect because at the end, the one who decides what is trained in one particular class is basically the instructor, which is there. And this seems very much dependent on the biography of the instructor, of the individual selection criteria, which he she thinks is, is good. Yeah. Thank you. Do this, do this with your session. Thank you very much. <laughs>